Hertz picked it up because it told this very simple and interesting story. And I just wanted to point out like this idea between behind this like web design and cartography influences. Well, I don't think that the colors and the and the basic laws and rules that we've come up with with cartography are going to go anywhere. Just think about the same behind design. Different colors don't work together in design, but think about this flat UI revolution that's happened. And I think we're going to see this same playful playfulness at the edge of cartography, where a lot of different people are going to be coming with different ideas that are going to be informing cartography in a totally new way. So the second thing that I think is really um, defining maps right now is that we're moving beyond history. So one thing about every map that you show, uh, not, just, not just battles in the US on a historical map, but even open street map data, it's historical. It's data that was, was collected. Um, I, I was looking at this because I was trying to, I was trying to figure out um, I was trying to figure out something. I was trying to figure out the growth rate of data in OpenStreetMap, and I saw um, I saw the, the steepest of the curves, and the growth rate is like 10% per year. Uh, and then I, I was thinking about Moore's law, and how Moore's law is doubling every year. And there's another one called Kreider's law or Kreider's rule, which says hard drive space, and he predicted it would be 40% per year, but they're finding that it's around. 15% per year, which means that our ability to store data is actually growing faster than what we as a community are collecting as geospatial data. But that's not true at all because we're approaching this moment of the Internet of Things, right? So we're all collecting this data that's happening at real time. So this woman tweeted the other day, uh, as I was making these slides actually, that she was on the move again. So she makes these maps uh, with CartaDB where she's writing her own location into a CartaDB account. And you can look at that map, and it will be the latest information of her moving. And what she does is she, tr she tries to do things like circumnavigate the world under her own power. And so here she is. She, she, this was an old trip of hers. And I was sitting next to the guy that helped her make this map. And he zoomed into this area. And he said, yeah, she was in a rowboat here off of, the, off of Japan. And she got stuck into these, in these winds. And she couldn't make it further north to Alaska. I was like, oh, yeah, I hate when that happens. And, she, and she's like, and I was like, well, I was like, how long was she there? And she, he was like, a week. I was like, wow, what a, what a crazy thing. So uh, I do this on my own, actually. I have this map. I have this, I have this app in my phone that writes my own location to a CartaDB account. And then I can just show people that map. I don't do anything good with it. But things could be done with it. Like, I can start to see, you know, just from looking at this data, uh, look, wait till it goes back to the beginning. I used to live in one neighborhood. Um, in a neighborhood Cobble Hill here, and my office was in, in Manhattan. And then I moved to Bed-Stuy, and then our office moves to Williamsburg. And you can see my like, life pattern. Just, just with just those three variables, latitude, longitude, and time, you're able to tell very, very clear messages in the behavior of me. So imagine adding the other things to that, too. This is me last night. But other companies are coming around with this same idea. So the idea of map mapillary. So collecting, collecting this uh, um, OpenStreetMap uh, version of Street View, very interesting. But the idea of having connected cars doing this automatically. Um, Mapbox's work to do data pipelines and pushing out uh, really beautiful satellite imagery so fast uh, is going to be really powerful. And projects like, um, uh, like Skybox and a lot of these satellite companies. And Skybox is so interesting because um, because of the idea of collecting video and being able to actually see some of that video potentially in real time. Another area where I think it's, um, it's profoundly changing is this idea of a different map for every viewer. So this is something that I don't think a lot of people think about um, probably as much as they should. And, and I, I pulled one over on you when I was talking about this powerful uh, weatherman um, because we don't actually get the weather like that anymore. We get the weather much more like this. It's these hyper-personal, delivered just to you, knowing exactly what bed you're in and what the weather is outside your front door. Uh, I stole this from a slide in a um, map time talk. And I really loved it. It was basically just demonstrating um, the, the different tiles. But the thing is, you, you can think about it too. Like The whole tile doesn't have to change anymore on the map, just the smallest piece of the tile. And you may not notice it. And so Google does it in a couple different ways. Google does it with borders. I'm, I'm sure that a lot of you have seen this project to document all the places where Google differs in different countries, showing different borders to the viewer, depending on what country they're in. 
but the same thing happens when you go and do a search on Google. And so you do a search on Google and, and it's going to show you something different than me and it's going to be based on your past behaviors. And so that's actually, that seems to fit with the modern web, but that doesn't fit with what we know of maps. I'm not folding out a map that I can hand to you and you're going to see the very same thing. You're going to possibly see different roads, different houses, different stores. And this can happen in every map on the web these days. CartaDB has the ability to give you a different map um, based on who, who your user is. Not many people are doing it, but it's totally possible using the SQL API and dynamic data. And then the last place that I think that maps are profoundly different right now is this dis disappearing act that's actually happening with the map. So things like the Google car and Google Glass, no, just kidding. Um, <laughs> But things like GeoLoki, if anybody um, ever followed GeoLoki before they were bought by Esri, the idea of having geo triggers is, is something that now is happening in a lot of applications that we're using. And so that means that there's a map that is running in the background that's defining the messages and the information that you're getting. Things like iBeacon that are tracking you indoors and sending you those same messages and being paired up with things to send you commercials and things like that. And I wanted to put this one in here because I wanted to be the first Fos4G to exit with a Tinder um, slide. Uh, but Tinder, like, the, like this idea that dating now is actually happening on a map, but you never see the map. It's just doing it for you. And so slowly the map is actually disappearing. It's folding back. And so this idea that a map can change and you're never going to see it is actually a pretty powerful and potentially scary thing. So finally, before I take some questions, I just want to welcome you to the new age of maps, and thank you. Any questions? The part where you mentioned uh, missing the next train. Yeah. Uh, I don't think you can really miss the next train. If you missed it, it's the last train. Yeah, it's totally true. That's why the anxiety doesn't make sense, right? The train will always come. Anybody else? Um, you kind of hinted at it throughout the slides with your story about the uh, New York subways and photos of iPhones and things like that. I mean, what's, what about you know, mobile maps? How has mobile maps changed maps and, and what are you know, technologies or platforms that you can see maps moving towards? <sighs> Well, that's, a really, that's like a really broad question. I guess like mobile maps are the ones um, that make me think the most about the map that every viewer sees the same. I, like, I always talk about this when I've had a few beers. But the idea that, um, like, the, idea that the map provider knows you, you're not at home, and the map provider knows that you're at the bar having a drink, and the map provider knows that you're probably staying at my house on the couch, and the map provider knows that if you're in a different country, maybe you forgot your toothbrush, so the route home maybe goes by a CVS. Like those sorts of simple like things, I don't think they're happening yet, but they are that they're totally possible. Um, so that's one thing I always think about with mobile maps. Um, and then I think that more and more, besides that like navigational tool, we're going to see the more of the like Tinder trying to trying to make the geo disappear more because I think we're going to become much more capable of making powerful things that are less visual. I guess. Yeah. Well, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm not probably like a, I'm probably not an expert on anything I talked about today. So, uh, but I think that, I think that like what we're seeing right now is, is GIS is coming back to computer science, like just in a really big way. And so if you're not learning GIS within the context of like development and debugging and, and like frameworks and all those things, then it's going to be a much harder tool to apply. But at the same time, that like that's going to be such a slow process. There's still some. There's still really hard pieces of GIS that we're not even. Well, we're not always trying to automate. We're not trying to build into systems. So, I think I think it's going to come back, but it's going to be like slowly peeling away that GIS onion. Is the 
what is a future GIS or GL professional look like? Or is that a part of the top of our beers? Hey, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think there's going to be a lot of different ones because what we're seeing now is that there's no, there's basically no field left that isn't trying to use geo in some way. And yeah, yeah. So that's, that's a pretty complex one to answer, I guess, easy. So anything else? Yeah. Well, I, I guess the, what I mean by that is that a lot of times the map is used as like this, as we're able to take one data set and add it back to, you know, physical space, like road networks or mountains or whatever it is, in a very literal way. And what I think is that people are getting more clever about just pulling out the thing that you're going for and giving it to you more directly instead of just giving you that, that mashup, you know? Um, but I don't really know. I don't really know. I don't know. Oh, sure. Um, there's been some anthropological work on uh, giving them GPSs and getting them to go out and walk the boundaries of their dream maps. Right? Wow. Because, <laughs> but it actually, it's, a very, uh, it's got a very strong application. They have, to, they have to know how much territory they're claiming in order to tax them and to, and to, you know, and to make sure that, that there are incursions in their territory. Huh. But when you showed the map of the different ways that you can see the boundaries, and if, if you're in, uh, you know, Western Europe as opposed to Eastern Europe, I can't remember the, the countries, it be, makes me wonder whether we won't get to a point where everybody sees their own map and they may, they may not agree with other people's maps, not just have different things, you know, like um, highlighted, but just not agree. Right. Right. Yeah, I mean, that's something that, like, at a very, at, like, a very surface level, we, we, like, have to think about at CartoDB just because we offer things like geocoding and stuff like that. But, but at a very deep level, I think, yeah, it's very hard to tell where that's going to go. Like, is it, are we going to see more and more diversification of what people call boundaries, or are we going to see sort of a, a giving up and the idea that we have to just come to some common vocabularies? I don't know. Thank you. Oh, one more. One last question. What about this? I mean, are you, what do you think about people losing the ability to wayfind on their own without technology? Because it seems like some of that is happening. Like, your people going into the subway with the map, like, the entrance is in yeah. the entrance. But, like, losing a spatial sense and developing a spatial sense. Yeah. You know, when I lived in, when I lived in Boulder, Colorado, I always knew where I was going because the mountains were always west. And now I live in New York, and I never know where I'm going unless I look at my eye or look at my phone. So I don't know. I don't know if the phone actually like reduced that, or if it just helps me when I'm when I don't have any like sensibility of my own. You know what I'm saying? So I don't know. That's a. I, I think that there's a lot of people that are looking at that in a more academic way. I'm curious what they'd say. I'll probably Google it after. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thanks.